Pandora the World of Avatar is amazing. It's not just a land that's incredibly well themed, but aims to really impress and wow its audience through atmosphere. I know that I've offered quite a bit of criticism of the leadership of Bob Iger and Bob Chapek, ultimately concluding that their additions to the parks have been, at best, mediocre. At worst, insulting. If Disney's new additions to its parks don't really do anything for you, then I do recommend checking out one of my more recent videos where I break down why this is the case. But why is Pandora the exception to this rule? I've seen a lot of people criticize Flight of Passage as a Soarin' clone, but I don't agree. There's also the consensus that Navi River Journey might leave you feeling a bit... unsatisfied. I would agree, but it's not for a lack of effort. So today, we're going to be breaking down what I feel is easily the best addition to the Disney parks over the last few decades, and why it works when so many other recent Disney additions have not. When Bob Iger announced that Pandora would be coming to Animal Kingdom, there was quite a bit of confusion. People were asking, how does something like this fit into Animal Kingdom? What does a sci-fi franchise have to do with animals? Sure, the film has animals in it, but that's just a superficial reason to shoehorn it into this park. The film is inherently about human conflict with an alien race, and while the Na'vi as a species are quite in tune with nature, it's not really something that would initially seem to fit into the park. To answer why this works, let's consult a piece of promotional material. In the film Avatar, where we see the world of Pandora, that world is created digitally. We're now going to make that world physical. The realism of it, the incredible fidelity to detail of that world, I think is going to really take people by surprise. It feels really as if you are standing there on another planet. There are several things we're doing in the world of Pandora. One of them is, of course, all the stories are your personal adventures. We're not really telling you the story of something that happened to somebody else. But more than that, every event that happens on Pandora, every animal you see, every plant you see, the things that happen to you, those are all tied to real things on planet Earth. So you can learn about issues and events on Earth from the things you see and experience on Pandora. If you think about intrinsic value of nature, transformation through adventure, personal call to action, these are the values of Animal Kingdom. If you say them again, those are the themes of the film Avatar. So Avatar and Animal Kingdom will nest into each other, I think, very, very neatly, and Avatar can become a fantastic anchor in the public mind for the rest of Animal Kingdom. Pandora isn't something that really should have worked. I keep mentioning it over and over again, but the majority of Disney's new additions to its parks are very much a response to universal success with the Wizarding World. Pandora is no different, but it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of why the Harry Potter franchise delivers. Bob Iger saw that Avatar was the highest grossing film up to that point in time, and decided that it was a strong brand that people would like to see manifested as a land in the Disney parks. But is it? It's not that there aren't super fans of the film out there, but general consensus seems to be that the film is just pretty okay. Anecdotally, I can say that a large reason that people continue to go and see it multiple times was because they thought the visual effects were groundbreaking and impressive on their own. On a side note, those CGI effects have not aged well at all. What makes the Wizarding World so appealing to people is that the world building of the fiction is addictive and enticing. It's oftentimes described as something that people want to get lost in, despite the darker elements of the story. I'm not saying that people don't want to visit the moon of Pandora, especially now that the land itself is built and successful, but that's certainly not the reason that the film did so well, at least not in the West. Its success came from the novelty of its 3D effects and CGI, 
and to desperately play catch-up while still not understanding how Universal took some of your market share is folly. If Pandora were announced today, I would still say it's a bad idea. The only reason the land works is through the leadership of Joe Rohde and how he played such a large role in shaping Pandora to reflect the values of Animal Kingdom. Beyond the trees and floating mountains, the narrative behind Pandora is what allows it to fit in so well with the rest of the park. In the film, the moon is being mined for an element called unobtainium by the Resources Development Administration, or RDA. The RDA is a militant operation and utilizes soldiers to protect mining sites and equipment. Scientists, under the leadership of Dr. Grace Augustine, work with the RDA and utilize lab-grown Navi bodies, or avatars, to communicate with and learn about the inhabitants. The central conflict of the film revolves around the militant side of the RDA, trying to displace the Navi from a potential mining site, and are ultimately defeated by the Navi through the leadership of the main character, Jake Sully, in Avatar form. The land in Animal Kingdom takes place a generation after the conflict of the film, and the humans and Navi have achieved peace together. The company that oversees your journey to this area, called the Valley of Moara, is Alpha Centauri Expeditions, or ACE. Visiting Pandora, you yourself are an ecotourist looking to explore the natural world of the moon and learning to connect with nature. The theme of the land obviously fits with the rest of Animal Kingdom, in that the land itself helps you explore human relationships to nature, and of course, animals. But, you might wonder, those are real animals. The land portrays fictional ones. Well, in the early conceptual stages for Animal Kingdom, there was to be a land called Beastly Kingdom that portrayed various mythical animals. Animal Kingdom isn't just about human relationships to real animals, but also to those that influenced culture and myth. The land itself would be split into two parts. A light side that included a maze where you could discover a unicorn, and a boat ride called Fantasia Gardens themed to various segments of Fantasia that featured mythical animals. The dark side of the land would be anchored by an inverted roller coaster called Dragon Tower, where bats would tempt you into trying to steal the gold of a fire-breathing dragon. Obviously, while Beastly Kingdom was never built, remnants and teases of it can be found in the park today. While these plans never came to fruition, Expedition Everest, featuring the Yeti, very much followed in the footsteps of wanting to expose guests to a mythical creature and how it's ingrained in human culture. I think that this is the reason that Pandora makes sense for Animal Kingdom. It's a very contemporary story of fictional creatures and it provides commentary on human relationships to nature. A mythical story doesn't need to be old to have power and provoke people into reconsidering their role in the world. That's why Pandora, with its focus on fictional animals, still very much fits into one of the themes of Animal Kingdom, making it a spiritual successor to Beastly Kingdom. The value system that underlies the story of Avatar and the value system that underlie Animal Kingdom are pretty much the same. There is an intrinsic value of nature. How do we conserve this habitat and bring back habitat that's been disturbed by people? It wasn't just going to be about action and conflict. We were going to move past that. We're here long after the war between the humans and the Navi has ended. It's a time of peace. We see nature resurgent, coming back everywhere. This is a real ecosystem. It is a chance to have your own adventures on Pandora. Before talking about the main draw, which are the attractions, Let's talk a bit about the land itself, because it's incredibly well thought out. In the film, it's established that humans cannot breathe the atmosphere of Pandora. So here at the entrance of the land, we have a large plant called Flasca reclinata. This species acts to clean and purify the air of Pandora, making it much more friendly for oxygen-breathing organisms like ourselves. As an interactive experience, the soft red spot, when stimulated, releases that purified oxygen as a misting effect. Let's once again consult some marketing material to really understand the creative philosophy behind this land. I think the biggest challenge was 
creating interactive opportunities for guests where they feel engaged by it. This is in a, a, a way a kind of habitat restoration project to allow the forests of Awa to research. You get in here and it's almost like you're petting an animal, right? You get in there, yep, make yep. contact with that surface. Right. That contacts the nerve structure. Right. And then the whole thing starts to send spores right. off. And then down the valley, there's tons of little ones that are starting to right, grow. Right. You should be thinking of our lands as characters. The land is portraying the emotion. The land is teaching you how to respond and what it means to be in the place. Every plant and every creature is placed in such a way as to tell a story throughout the land. Easily the most impressive aspect of it though, the floating mountains are an engineering marvel in and of themselves and are constructed in such a way as to be surprisingly convincing. You can also find scattered remnants of the RDA left behind, showing how nature has reclaimed the destruction that the company inflicted on the area. Take for example the quick service restaurant Satuli Canteen. Once an RDA mess hall, it has been repurposed by Ace and turned into a location that features Navi art, as well as selling Pandoran food. As a quick service restaurant, it's some of the better food that Disney offers. The food itself is well thought out and is meant to feel fresh and light. The idea for creating an otherworldly alien food was taken from Satuli and applied to Docking Bay 7 food and cargo at Galaxy's Edge. While not bad by any means, my experience with the food here seems to be an emulation of what Satuli has already been offering, and I just wish that it was a bit more unique. I don't want to spend too much time on the land, because it's something that you should really discover for yourself. However, it very much follows in the same design philosophy of the other areas of Animal Kingdom though, telling its story through the use of smaller details. Every single aspect of the land, from the rock work to the plants, are all meticulously well thought out. With this being said, let's now move on to the main draw, which are the attractions themselves. Pandora as a Land is anchored by Avatar Flight of Passage, which in my opinion is the best attraction to be built under the Iger and Chapek era. You first enter the queue from under the floating mountains, and is designed in such a way as to make you feel you're continuously hiking and working your way up into a mountain range. Throughout this outside portion of the queue, the scenery focuses on rock work and nature. Navi tribal art, portraying the Ikron or Banshee, which is the animal you will be riding, is represented through woven art. As you continue up the mountain path, you next enter a cave. Here, Navi art is again found, representing their relationship with the Banshees. You can even find an artistic rendition of the Leonopteryx, the apex predator of the Pandoran sky. As you continue through the cave system, you enter the remains of an area where a drainage pipe was leaking waste from the RDA into the forest. You can't see it too well from my footage, but there's also a sign here addressing the environmental damage and how it's being studied. It's subtle details like this that allow the attraction to fit into Animal Kingdom. Environmental damage is another theme of the park. Whether it be the wrath of the Yeti having its environment encroached upon by running a train through the mountains, or how logging practices can potentially destroy an ecosystem when done in excess on Kali River Rapids. As you exit the drainage pipe, you move back outside into the bioluminescent forest on the face of a cliff. Obviously, this portion of the queue is not really outside, but it's meant to convey that you've been traveling for at least a few hours. Now is also a good time to mention that almost none of the land or its cues features any music. Instead, you hear the sounds of the creatures around you, whether that be them moving through the brush nearby or crying to communicate with one another. Depending on the time of day, you can hear different animals throughout the land, and from what I can perceive, they seem to become more active at night. In this particular part of the queue, you're meant to just take in the sounds of the jungle at its most active, while also appreciating the beauty of the bioluminescence. In the final portion of the queue, you move into a former RDA mining facility that has been repurposed by ACE into a research lab. Here, you can find a number of details that help flesh out the story being told. For example, this poster towards the front of the lab conveys that research is actively being done on understanding the effects of the destruction of the Pandoran ecosystem from the mining operations of the RDA. In this lab area that the queue circles around, 
you can find some really interesting practical effects that show these small organisms being studied and how they infect the environment, and vice versa. Another highlight of this portion of the queue is the avatar itself, showing guests what they'll be connecting with. There's definitely a lot that you can find in the details here. It's really a testament to the effort and creativity that went into this project. It's easy to be Bob Iger and falsely assume that because Harry Potter is a high-grossing movie franchise, that people will also be automatically drawn to Pandora because of Avatar's box office performance. That's not what's happening here, though. It's not, hey, I hear you like Frozen, so here it is. Instead, this attraction and the land that surrounds it respects the intellectual capacity of the guests. It's not pandering to the type of people who find Spaceship Earth boring because Moana's grandmother isn't flying around in it. To clarify, I'm not saying that the use of intellectual property is inherently bad, but it's being used as a substitute for actual effort and creativity. That's the attitude behind Pandora. So let me emphasize that we were incredibly lucky to see the leadership of Joe Rohde and his team turn this into the incredible experience that it is. So now, let's talk about the ride experience itself and why it's so great. As you finish the main portion of the queue, you're grouped down a line that prepares you for the pre-show portion of the attraction. From here, you're sent to a room where a lab technician explains that you'll be riding on an Ikron or Banshee, which is a rite of passage for the Na'vi. To do so, the room will scan your genetic makeup to match you with an avatar that is the closest fit to your genetics. The pre-show includes a lot more, such as going through a segment where you're scanned and decontaminated for microparasites, a segment on explaining how the process for linking you to an avatar works, and a lot of exposition and context for the world of Pandora, among other things. Once this pre-show concludes, you enter a second pre-show hosted by Dr. Jackie Ogden, who is the head of the Pandora Conservation Initiative. The second pre-show just reiterates a lot of information and in how linking with an avatar works. It's essentially an instructional video for how to properly board the ride vehicle. You move into the next room with the link chairs, mounting them like you would a banshee, and from here, the experience begins. It's not easy to convey on video, but it immediately starts as a visceral experience. Let's talk about the technical aspects of the attraction first. A strobe effect works really well in conjunction with the linking process that's being visually portrayed to mask the wall in front of you raising, revealing the screen. Yes, this attraction is similar to Soren in having that large dome screen, but obviously you're experiencing a much larger degree of movement as flying on a banshee is simulated. You can even feel the ride vehicle moving between your legs in such a way as to emulate a banshee breathing. And while the effect does feel mechanical, it's a level of thought and detail that wasn't necessary in an already stellar experience. As soon as you're linked to your avatar, wind effects kick in, which are simple but effective in selling the idea of flying. Your ride vehicle also has a nozzle on it that mists your face in various scenes that feature water throughout the ride. Again, it's simple, but quite effective. There are also scents pumped towards you, adding another sensory dimension to the experience. For example, flying through the forest here, you receive a very earthy scent. In this later scene, in the bioluminescent cave, you're treated to a scent that's sweet and aromatic. The last technical aspect of the attraction is the 3D effect, which has come quite a long way. It's so well done that I often forget it's even part of the attraction because of how well integrated it is. Long gone are the days of novelty 3D, where something is shoved into your face, and instead, the 3D works here to make the world feel more tangible and less like a screen. Too exceptional effect, I might add. The 3D goggles that you wear for Flight of Passage even have a stupid level of thought put into them as well. They're designed to look like a piece of equipment that you put on to interface with the link chair, but the actual lenses that you look through are blurred around the edges to simulate looking through the eyes of another body. On a technical level, it's doing a lot more than Soren, 
And so I think it's a mistake to compare them. So then, what is the actual content of the attraction itself? Well, the idea behind Flight of Passage is to immerse you into the world of Pandora from the perspective of flying on a banshee. And that's it. From a narrative perspective though, it's a lot more similar to something like Pirates of the Caribbean than it is to an attraction like Rise of the Resistance. That might sound strange, but think about it this way. Pirates is a slow-moving boat ride that takes you past a series of scenes. These scenes are well detailed and have a lot going on, but you're able to absorb and process a lot of it because of the pace of the boat. Rise of the Resistance, on the other hand, emulates a new generation of narrative-driven attractions pioneered by Universal. Take for example an attraction like Transformers. There's definitely a narrative playing out here, but it's thrown at the audience in such a chaotic and fast-paced manner that it's really difficult to process what's going on. It definitely took me a few times of writing to understand what I was seeing. While this isn't necessarily a bad way to design an attraction, I think the contrast is clear. Rise of the Resistance has a somewhat slower pace than Transformers, but still very much follows in its footsteps and has a series of fast-paced scenes that rely more on action and not detail. Despite feeling like a fast-paced experience, Flight of Passage actually gives you a lot of time to digest what you're seeing. The attraction moves you through various biomes of Pandora, allowing you just enough time in each one to register what you're seeing. So to break it down, you have the treetops, the cascading waterfalls, the forest, the harbor. This one features a tribe that lives near the ocean, and you later encounter this Mosasaurus-inspired creature in a thrilling encounter. You next move into a floating mountain range, where again you have a thrilling encounter, this time with a Leonopteryx. However, the scene plays out long enough to allow you to process what's happening. You make your escape into a cave where the pace of the experience slows down to allow you to experience the visual beauty of the bioluminescence. To continue, you have the diving scene, the herd, and finally, the sunset. Flight of Passage is incredibly simple in concept, but extremely effective in execution. A stranger on an attraction-based forum made the comment to me the other day that the queue for Rise of the Resistance is incredibly well done and immersive. But is it? The props of the queue are somewhat randomly scattered about, and don't make much logical sense in their placement. However, the entirety of the queue for Flight of Passage is conveying your journey. It excels in fleshing out the world around you with every single detail having a purpose. It helps to immerse you into the experience of linking with an avatar. The ride itself, from a technical standpoint, is impressive in the level of thought and detail that went into trying to simulate the idea of being transported to another body and place. Finally, the design philosophy behind the loose narrative of the attraction follows very much in the vein of many Disney classics. Sure, it's a simulator that makes you feel like you're moving quickly and not a slow-moving boat ride, but that's obviously deceptive because you're allowed to register the amazing world of Pandora and the various scenes as they play out. There are certainly thrilling moments, but you're allowed a lot of breathing room between them. This is why I believe that Flight of Passage is one of the best Disney attractions ever created, and in conjunction with the land itself, creates the best land to come out of the Iger and Chapek era. As you know, I will argue that it's a fluke, because we've seen some of the other Disney creations that I attribute to the creative bankruptcy of Disney leadership. So, with all of this being said, it begs the question, what happened to Navi River Journey? It 
If you've watched some of my other videos, you'll see that I've made the case that Disney isn't really trying with a lot of its attractions anymore. The idea is that you could stick an IP on something and do the bare minimum and people will still come. However, I do not believe that Navi River Journey follows this trend. I don't know this for sure, but there are a lot of strong rumors out there that Pandora went far over budget. So far over budget that Navi River Journey almost wasn't built. This makes a lot of sense to me, and I think that the ambitious scope of the land and Flight of Passage reveal that to be quite plausible. As you enter the queue for River Journey, the outside portion is well themed like the rest of the land, but as you enter under the Navi Hut, the theming becomes quite minimal. It's really just a long series of switchbacks, and while Navi culture is represented through woven art, just like in the rest of the land, there's still a lot of lost potential here. It's not a lack of effort on the part of the Imagineers, so much as it is a very clear sign of going over budget elsewhere. The actual attraction itself also leaves a lot to be desired. Many people are surprised to learn that this attraction can be around 6 minutes long, because it feels significantly shorter. Let's make some quick comparisons. Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin at Magic Kingdom clocks in at just a bit over 4 minutes, but it feels like a much longer ride experience, right? Even Flight of Passage, from when it first starts, is about 4 minutes 30 seconds. Yet, it feels like a much longer attraction. People always complain that River Journey is short, but that's not the problem. The problem is that it's empty. Let's quickly consult James Cameron. The River Journey is such a beautiful experience. You really feel like you're moving through the rainforest at night, so the colors of the bioluminescence and all the animals that come out at night, you see all these little vignettes going on around you in the forest, and it just, it just comes to life. And then, of course, I don't want to spoil it, but there's something pretty amazing at the end of that river ride that you've never seen anything like in your life. And there's the problem. What little budget this ride did have was blown on the animatronic for the Navi Shaman. Don't get me wrong, it looks fantastic, but the climax of the attraction is focused on the technical ability of this animatronic. In my previous video where I spoke about why I was so impressed by the Secret Life of Pets attraction that opened at Universal Hollywood, I made the point that Disney and Universal have been making the mistake of blowing attraction budgets on high-level animatronics rather than populating their scenes with lower-level animation. See how this feels far more fleshed out? The entire attraction is just like this. If we want an example from Disney, we can go back to Pirates. A lot of the animatronics here have limited movement, but that doesn't mean that they still don't look great. Not everything has to be the animated auctioneer for guests to enjoy the attraction. River Journey actually proves this at the very beginning. You first encounter this Navi Scout, who isn't even an animatronic, but is a projection effect on a mannequin. He beckons you forward with his hand, but would it have really been that hard to do it with a physical piece? Right before you encounter the Shaman, you also encounter projections of the Navi heading towards the Ritual, and once you're there, you don't see them. Again, this is an attraction that could really benefit from the use of low-level animatronics populating its scenes. For what it is, the attraction is quite beautiful and immersive, and the screen-based scenes actually look really good. I'm not sure how they work exactly, but I believe these scenes consist of multiple screen and projection layers, adding a convincing sense of depth to them. However, this doesn't stop the attraction from feeling empty, because it lacks a physical element other than the plants and some very minimal practical effects sparsely found throughout. I don't think that Navi River Journey is even a bad attraction, but I think it's hardly worth more than a 20 minute wait, when it actually often reaches over an hour or even two. It's an attraction that has a lot of lost potential, and could have easily been the next classic Disney boat ride had it received the budget it deserved. Pandora is easily Disney's most ambitious land. It takes the small details that flesh out the other lands of Animal Kingdom, but does so on a much more awesome scale. Yes, I will indeed argue that I feel Pandora is more ambitious than Galaxy's Edge. It's not that Galaxy's Edge doesn't follow in telling its story through detail, but it borrows a lot from what was already pioneered through Pandora and doesn't execute it as well. For example, we see that the First Order occupies part of the city, 
but why is it there? We also know that the resistance is on Batu, but again, why? Is the resistance here to fight the Hearst Order, or are they here to hide? Perhaps, Batu hides a person, object, or information that could help the resistance. Ultimately, though, it doesn't matter because the story that the land supposedly tells isn't well thought out. In contrast, we certainly understand the goal of Ace and how it fits into the Valley of Moara. Pandora as a land also very clearly fits into the themes and messages of conservation in human relationships to nature that define Animal Kingdom. Galaxy's Edge does no such thing. We've also already spoken about how the food of Galaxy's Edge, which isn't bad, emulates what Pandora has already been offering, but in a better way. Another example previously used was how the props found in the queue for Rise of the Resistance don't tell the story of the attraction or give you any setup other than you're in a Resistance hideout. There's not any particular reason that the props are laid out the way they are. In contrast, the queue for Flight of Passage expresses your journey and is littered with subtle details that flesh out the world you're in. The attraction itself, despite being a simulator, follows the design philosophy of so many classic Disney attractions. Navi River Journey, in contrast, might not deliver the best experience, but it's not for lack of trying, and I think that's excusable because at the very least it's a creative vision. To conclude, Pandora the World of Avatar is the right land for Animal Kingdom, but for the wrong reasons. It is, in my opinion, a cynical idea born from Disney being caught off guard by its best competitor. The idea for Pandora lacks understanding from what guests want, and the excellence of the land stems from the real creatives within the company. I'm curious though, if as a viewer, do you agree with the points I've made? Pandora certainly isn't without flaw, but I do genuinely feel that it stands as something great regardless. If you enjoy these types of video essays, I do encourage you to leave a like on the video so that we can reach a wider audience. As always, if you're not subscribed, you can hit the subscribe button and bell notification to be alerted when new videos are released.